Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from NBC Sports Network, Jan Bikas. Thank you, Jack. Good morning. We've heard some great stories, certainly, some great memories of the Indianapolis 500 today. And one of my greatest memories is just a little bit in a different category. I had just started working in television. For ESPN, we were covering qualifying on one of those long weekends when there was a NASCAR race happening in California. So the producer calls me down on my headset and says, Jan, anything happening down there? And I said, well, I have this infrared heat gun and I'm noticing that the track temperature is dropping. I think we're gonna get some action. He says, perfect. How would you like to do a live cut in into the NASCAR race in Sonoma with that information? Sure. He says, okay, just say you're at IMS, give him the information and throw it back to Bob Jenkins at Sonoma Raceway. Got it. Three, two, one, go. Hi, I'm Jan Bikas, and I'm here at the... And at that moment, there was a bad audio patch. It went from my microphone here to the television compound via satellite to California, back again, through up to my radio, and full blast in my headset. Three-second delay. Not like a stadium delay. This was a delay. My mind froze. I was scrambled, and all I could remember was the producer said, tell them you're at IMS. So I'm at the International Motor Sport. I'm like, dude, you're dying here. It's the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Do something else. I took the gun. Oh, I have this speed gun. No, it's not a speed gun. It's a heat gun. I'm a, this is a live cut into the big NASCAR show. I'm just melting down on the pit lane of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, which I couldn't remember. I somehow muddle through it, get to the end, throw it back to Bob Jenkins in Sonoma, and I just laid out on the asphalt. I said, I'm done. That's it for TV. There was nothing, it was dead silence. And finally the producer said, Jan, do you still have your helmet? Now the whole racing, side of the story started for me at six. You heard that from Susie Weldon that she is a driver already at five. I started in quarter mid, it started racing when I was 12 and got hooked. At 18, I moved to Europe, chased that dream. And to say that I was single-minded was an understatement. I was completely focused. I would not do anything. I wouldn't touch the refrigerator, the remote control, anything without first asking the question, will this make me go faster in a race car? I took every piece of food, weighed it on a gram scale, entered it into a computer, and got a printout at the end of the day of my intake. I would put three pairs of sweats on, the hottest time of day, run up and down hills until I'd pass out to raise my target heart rate. I banned my family from the racetrack because it was affecting my concentration. And if I had a girlfriend at the time and my results weren't what they should be, sorry, honey, this isn't working out. Now, I wouldn't advocate this approach, but it did work. Jack mentioned that I won the Indy Lights Championship in 1988. That gave me my shot at IndyCar. My first race was Toronto. I'm out on the racetrack. Mario Andretti, Michael Andretti, A.J. Foyt, Al Unser Jr., all the drivers that I had just watched on television coming up through the ranks, I'm on the track. Seriously, it was all I could do not to wave. Al, it's Jan. <laughs> so I'm living the dream, right? I was, but when I got on the airplane to travel home, I had this sense of something missing. Now, I'd always had this, but I figured, well, what's missing? I'm not at the top level of the sport, so of course it's going to feel like something's missing until I get there. But I had it now. I'm at the top level. It's still missing. What could it be? Hmm. Well, I've kicked the relationships to the curb along the way through all those examples I gave you. It must be relationships. I'm feeling like something is missing because of that. Let's fix it. How do drivers fix things? Well, if you want to know how to go flat out through turn one, you go to turn one, you find someone who does it, and you mimic them. 
So who do I know who I could mimic on relationships? And the person that I chose was Hunter Floyd, who was the chaplain for what then was Motorsports Ministries, sort of the predecessor to IndyCar Ministries. Many of you know him. He's done hundreds of chapel services here at Indy. In fact, at the moment, I believe he's at Lucas Oil Raceway doing one as we speak. And I chose him because he's a former driver. He would come up to me, and he was the only person I could kind of put my finger on that would come to me. He would ask me questions about how I was doing. He had seen the timesheets. He would chat me up, but he never asked me for anything. And I thought, you know, that, that's how you want to be. That is a complete 180 from what I was doing. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to go to a chapel service to thank him for, for his efforts as my, my first task in fixing relationships. And when I got there, I realized that they were talking about a relationship, not necessarily with, with each other, but they were take, talking about a relationship with God. And they talk about how our sin separated us. And I'm like, well, I don't think I'm a bad guy. I'm not breaking any laws other than a few speed limits. And, but then it was described that falling short or sin is just non-perfection. Race drivers know about non-perfection. We all know you cannot do the perfect lap. We all know there's something left on the table. So I got that. Okay, perfect God, imperfect people, there's a gap. Okay, I'm starting to get the picture. I had a lot of questions for Hunter. I didn't want the other drivers to see me talking to the chaplain because that's going to be viewed as a sign of weakness. So we would sneak around the back of trailers and have these discussions. And he explained to me in John 14, 6, he said, you know, Jesus himself said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I said, well, how do I know this is true? And he gave me a book, he gave me just a paperback called More Than a Carpenter. You may be familiar with this. And, and the whole idea is that Josh McDowell says Jesus has to be one of three things. He is either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. And I read through this and just had this conviction that, in fact, he was Lord. So there's a prayer at the end of the book that I prayed that essentially I just acknowledged that I fell short that I recognized there was a gap and that Jesus not only died, but he rose from the dead to bridge that gap. I asked him into my life. And essentially in racer speak, that's like taking the steering wheel and saying, okay, God, you're driving now. And I'll have to say, I think maybe subconsciously I was thinking, you know, if God's driving, we could really be successful here. Well, it didn't exactly work that way. After having made that decision, I ended up in the hospital, on fire, or with a broken car, every race. My team ran out of money. There was no car to drive. I didn't get paid. The girlfriend that I was dating, trying to do the proper way now, she had other ideas. So as the California Surfer song said, no money, no chick, no car. <laughs> I'd accepted Christ. Racing is in the toilet. I'm a cause and effect kind of person. But I hung in there. I went to a pro athletes outreach conference where the speaker talked about God being omniscient, all knowing. And he said, you know, we in our lives only see one frame at a time. But God sees the whole film from beginning to end. And it dawned on me, wait a minute. God didn't take anything away from me. He already knew that racing was going to go into the toilet. And isn't it like God, he loved me so much, he wanted me to know him before that happened. That's when I understood the kind of love that God had. So what's the application? How do I go, for, what do I do with this? As I read through scripture, I found Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Starts that, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses which means that there are the greats that have gone before us sort of in a stadium or speedway environment. Let us throw off anything that hinders or the sin that so easily entangles. I knew how to do that. 
and let us run with perseverance the race set before us. Got it. So walking with God is like running a race. I, I've got a lot of experience with that. How do you do so? Well, 12.2 says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. And as a driver, you know you've got to look down the road at the big picture. You start looking over the nose of the car and things just rush at you. So there is that application. So I wanted to give you the opportunity in case God has brought you into this breakfast and has been working on your heart as he was for me if there's that if there's that piece that hasn't seemed to fit for you, I thought I'd just go ahead and read that very same prayer that I had read from this book, and you're more than welcome to, to follow along. So let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Forgive me and make me clean. Right this minute, I trust you as Savior and Lord. Make me the kind of person you created me to be. In Christ's name, amen. Now, there's no magic in the words themselves, but there is power in the intent. So to kind of put some... Put that into action, if you can do me with kind of the interactive part here. If you want to grab the, there's an envelope at each of the tables. Just go ahead and rip that open. And there are these comment cards inside and some pens. And you may say, oh, yeah, you know, conference, comment cards, you know. I never have time to fill that out. But the reason we're going to do so I talked about the great cloud of witnesses. That's the idea of the ministry. IndyCar ministry is here because of that model. You may notice that the chaplains now, they've kind of hijacked my life verse. On the back of their shirts, it now does say Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. Their goal as a chaplaincy is to be those that are in the stands cheering for you. That's the analogy. The best way we can cheer for you is to connect. So go ahead and put your name and address and so on. It helps them to have the opportunity to do so. And the second thing is I think this is your opportunity to do what I used to do, and that is to get that behind-the-scenes time, secret time, so to speak, with the chaplain. When we used to sneak around the back of a transporter and I would share things that I had questions with, that's what you can use the card for. Feel free to write a prayer request on the back or a question or something that you might have wanted to share with someone here in IndyCar ministry with a chaplain, and that's your device when you're done. You can slide them back into that envelope. They will all be read. They'll be prayed over, and it gives the opportunity to kind of put some feet to the ministry itself because the idea, obviously, is that we want to run this race together. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Jan Bekus, ladies and gentlemen.